Hello, my name is Aslam Ijez and I'm Assistant Professor of Surgery in the Division of Surgical Oncology at The Ohio State University and James Cancer Center. And I'll be speaking with you today on the advancements in the surgical treatment of gastric cancer. It's truly an honor and pleasure to speak with you this morning on behalf of the James Surgical Oncology team. Here at the James, we have a wide range of clinicians and researchers all focused on the single goal of ending cancer. With regards to stomach cancer, we have a great multidisciplinary team, including surgical oncologists, medical oncologists, gastroenterologists, radiation oncologists, and many others who have specialty expertise in this area. Dr. Alan Sung leads our division in, uh, of surgical oncology. Dr. Tim Pollack is a chair of the Department of Surgery and also within our division of surgical oncology. The rest of the team includes myself and Drs. Jordan Cloyd, Andre Manelchuk, and Mary Dillhoff. And we all have extensive clinical and research experience in, in uh, the treatment of gastric cancer. Gastric cancer is the fifth most common cancer diagnosis in the world and is highly variable by region. In the US, gastric cancer is only the 15th most common cause of cancer. Here is a heat map of the incidence of gastric cancer. And as you can see, incidence rates are highest in Eastern and Central Asia. Part of this is due to differences in risk factors such as drinking, smoking, and diet. Other influences involve screening efforts. Here in the US, there are no approved screening methods for gastric cancer. Rather, gastric cancer is often diagnosed after the symptoms have already set in and can include nonspecific abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and weight loss. This is different than countries with higher rates of gastric cancer where there are targeted screening efforts that include routine endoscopies to detect gastric cancer even before patients have any symptoms. There have been recent advances in the treatment of gastric cancer, which has resulted in improvement in survival um, for patients with this type of cancer. And these include newer chemotherapy regimens and agents, as well as advances in radiation and surgical techniques. Despite this, survival for patients with gastric cancer still remains poor. And the overall survival for patients with gastric cancer in the United States is only 32%. This is largely due to the fact that over 50% of cases are caught in advanced or metastatic stage. And traditionally, patients in this stage were not eligible for surgery. However, recent trials and data have led to an expansion of surgical options and techniques for patients with metastatic disease, and I'll get into this shortly. But as you can see here, the earlier that the gastric cancer is detected, the better prognosis is. Here's a little background of the anatomy related to gastric cancer. The esophagus or food pipe, which is located in the chest, drains into the stomach, which rests at the top portion of the abdomen. The stomach then empties into the duodenum, which is the first portion of the intestine, of the small intestine. Stomach cancer can develop anywhere in the stomach, either at the top, middle, or bottom part. And the location of where the cancer is dictates the type of surgery that's required to remove it. In addition, these yellow lymph nodes surround the stomach and are also removed at the time of surgery. This is because gastric cancer typically spreads to these lymph nodes first, if at all, and removal of these nodes provides an accurate picture of the stage of disease, but also improves outcomes following surgery. There are two main types of operations that we perform for stomach cancer, uh, either a total removal of the stomach and all the lymph nodes involved, or a partial removal of the stomach and all the lymph nodes involved. And again, this is based on whether the cancer is located closer to the esophagus or farther away, either at the high portion or low portion. Here on the left, there's a tumor in the distal or uh, portion that's away from the esophagus. In this location, we remove um, a portion of the stomach, but are able to preserve a portion of normal healthy stomach. This is called a distal gastrectomy. After this uh, tumor and stomach are removed, the intestines are rerouted to allow for a new passage of food and for this food to mix with the digestive enzymes and juices from the liver and pancreas. On the right-hand side, the tumor is high up on the stomach near the esophagus or food pipe. In this situation, we often have to remove the entire stomach. This is important because patients who don't have any stomach at all are at risk for things like dumping syndrome. This dumping syndrome results from a rapid delivery of food through the intestines that can result in dizziness, sweating, and changes in blood sugar. And so patients have to make the appropriate dietary modifications and avoid foods that um, cause this, which are things um, such as foods that are highest in sugar content. Perhaps the biggest advancement in, this, in the, uh, the surgical treatment for gastric cancer involves a minimally invasive approach. Traditionally, surgery requires a big incision down the middle of the abdomen to remove the stomach as seen on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, minimally invasive surgery allows for the same type of operation except it's performed through small keyhole incisions 
which are no bigger than one centimeter in size. This minimally invasive approach has several benefits, including small scars, as seen in the previous slide, uh, less blood loss during surgery. Um, the smaller scars can also reduce the amount of pain felt after surgery, which can also result in a shorter hospital stay and faster recovery. Furthermore, a minimally invasive approach has been shown to result in less information, inflammation excuse me, than um, from an open operation. And this is important as cancer is often driven by inflammation, and so a decreased inflammatory response can potentially lead to better cancer outcomes. Finally, any patient who undergoes surgery on the abdomen is at risk for developing a hernia in that area, and patients who undergo a minimally invasive surgery have smaller scars and thus a lower chance of developing a hernia as compared to patients who undergo an open operation. Minimally invasive surgery can perform, be performed through a laparoscopic or robotic approach. On the left-hand side here is a typical laparoscopic setup in which long instruments are used through the keyhole incisions that I previously mentioned uh, to perform the operation. One disadvantage of this is that these instruments do not allow for a lot of uh, flexibility or dexterity when performing the operation. One solution for this problem is through the use of robotic surgery. And so here on the right-hand side is a typical setup for a robotic operation. We use the same keyhole incisions. However, through these keyhole incisions, we use robotic instruments which are then controlled by a surgeon at the robotic console with a few feet away from the patient. This allows for improved dexterity, dexterity and precision when performing these complex operations and allows us to do certain things that we weren't able to do before um, through a laparoscopic approach. Here at the James, we have a very robust robotic surgery program and are able to perform the majority of cancer operations on the stomach through a robotic approach. Another area of advancement involves patients with gas metastatic gastric cancer that I previously mentioned. Metastatic cancer is cancer that's spread outside the area of origin, in this case, the stomach, and typically includes sites like the liver or lungs. One additional area that's common for patients with gastric cancer includes the peritoneum. And here on the right side, as you can see, the peritoneum is a lining of the abdomen. And so this lining covers all the abdominal organs inside the abdomen. And gastric cancer can metastasize outside of the stomach to this peritoneum or lining of the abdomen. Typically, once it, the cancer has reached this lining of the abdomen, patients were not age, eligible for surgical resection and were only eligible for things like chemotherapy. However, with advances in chemotherapy and better response rates, we have expanded this criteria to include patients um, with metastasis in the peritoneum. And this is through something called HIPEC. And so HIPEC is called heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. And so for patients who respond well to systemic chemotherapy or chemotherapy that's delivered through the vein, we are able to offer them a potentially surgical solution for their cancer. This HIPEC delivers chemotherapy directly to the abdomen um, through a surgical operation rather than through uh, the IV, which is where it's commonly uh, delivered. And this the delivery of chemotherapy directly to the abdomen allows for a much higher concentration of chemotherapy in the tumors themselves um, uh, rather than when it's delivered through the vein. If a patient responds well to both chemotherapy and HIPEC, they're potentially eligible for surgical removal of their cancer. In one trial, 25% of patients who previously were uh, deemed unresectable or ineligible for surgical um, removal of their cancer, um, ended up having their cancer completely removed due to undergoing this HIPEC procedure. So as you can see, it allows for an increased number of patients to be eligible for curative tent uh, purposes in the terms of surgical resection. At the James, we're able to perform this HIPEC procedure through a minimally invasive approach. So again, traditionally, this procedure was performed through a large incision down the middle of the abdomen. However, here at the James, we use keyhole incisions and we can deliver this chemotherapy through those keyhole incisions. This has the major benefit of allowing patients to recover faster. They typically only spend one night in the hospital and are able to restart whatever um, chemotherapy or other uh, treatment that they were currently receiving um, rather than if they underwent an open operation. Some other areas of uh, interest in the treatment of gastric cancer include uh, earlier detection through improved screening efforts. And so there are multiple studies um, currently uh, uh, ongoing that are evaluating things like a liquid biopsy in which a tube of blood is used to detect a wide variety of cancers. 
Um, these techniques allow us to detect cancers at an earlier stage before any symptoms develop um, and can potentially improve the outcomes of patients with gastric cancer. Another area of interest is in the personalization of targeted and precision treatments for patients with gastric cancer. Here on the right is, de um, a, uh, uh, is depicted an organoid. An organoid is a uh, technique which allows us to take a sample of gastric cancer and grow the tumor outside in the laboratory. This allows us to test the tumor directly for different treatment modalities and see which ones respond well and which ones don't. After we're able to determine that, we can use those treatments on the patients themselves. Here at the James, we have several exciting and promising techniques and trials that we hope will improve the outcomes of patients with gastric cancer. Thank you again for allowing me to speak with you today, and please contact me if you have any additional questions. Thank you.